Jakarta, 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon in London, 3.30 in Europe. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe. 7 p.m. in India, 9.30 p.m. in Singapore, Malaysia. A very good evening to our colleagues in Asia. And at 11.30 p.m. in Australia, well, well, well past that time. Very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm Anupam Tipple. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist and the group medical director of Apollo Hospitals. I'm the current president of the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, or GAPIO. For those uh, friends who are joining for the first time, the Global Indian Physicians COVID-19 Collaborative was established on 11th April to bring together 1.4 million physicians of Indian, Indian origin across the globe on one platform. Uh, this collaborative uh, was created with the leadership of Harpy, Papio, the Canadian societies, the Australian societies coming together. Gapio now has members from 45 countries. Well, it's day 194 since the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed. We now have had 12.8 million reported cases and sadly 567,734 deaths have been reported. In India, as a result of the first lockdown and the multiple lockdowns we've had, uh, our doubling time is now 19 days. We have 849,553 cases with 20 2,674 deaths. The all knowledge explosion that has taken place. And on PubMed, if you type with 19, you get 29,859 papers, which is 154 papers a day. We look at COVID and treatment. That's more than 17,000 papers, which is 89 papers a day. So we as patients really need to have to study a lot to keep ourselves abreast of what is the latest today, and it might change tomorrow. And in India, there have been more than 1,019. So today's session is about therapy, when to use, what to use, when to use, and efficacy. Um, let's and uh, it's a privilege for me to introduce Dr. Om Ganda. Professor Om Ganda is... Um, it is MD from the All India Institute and has been at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center and Harvard Medical School in Boston since 1973. Uh, Om is the director of the Lipid Center and chair of the Clinical Guidelines Committee, has the 160 papers uh, published in high impact journals, including 25 chapters in books. Uh, he's received the Distinguished Physician Award at uh, New England and the New England People's Choice Award for Healthcare by the South Asian com Community last year. Uh, over to you, Om. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sibyl, for that very kind introduction. It's my pleasure to uh, make a few opening remarks. First of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Sibyl and his team for putting together this remarkable collaborative globally, which has been so successful already. And uh, in my opening remarks, uh, before we talk about therapy, I just wanted to say a few words about prevention and uh, then on to therapy. So uh, this is uh, just uh, another look at the global numbers of COVID-19 um, as of uh, very, very recent uh, tabulation. Shown here as of July 10th, last Friday, there were 3.2 million cases of uh, COVID-19 in the United States. Uh, and uh, next was Brazil with 1.8 million and India with about now more than 800,000 as of yesterday. So I think this is a very grim picture. We are all aware of that, and the numbers are not uh, decreasing anytime soon. In fact, uh, every day we are shattering the previous day's record uh, in the United States in many countries. I also wanted to show you on the right side of this uh, table the number of deaths. And uh, in India now, there are uh, more deaths. Than... We're not seeing your screen, so you might want to get on to share screen if you want to show us slides. Oh, let me see. I thought I was sharing the screen. Yeah. Can you see the screen now? Not yet. Can you see it now? No, we can't. Huh. Okay, let me try again. <laughs> Was working till a few minutes ago. So, well, if it doesn't, uh, then then you know, just share your your thoughts. Yeah, 
Uh, that's surprising. I thought I was sharing the screen, but uh, some very important information I wanted to share with you. So let me see if I can get back on here. Um, let me minimize the slides. This is very strange. Don't worry. I mean, if you could just just uh, share your your, your thoughts. Um, sometimes this happens. Though we tested a few minutes ago. Apologies to everyone, but we'll we'll just carry on in the interest of time. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned the numbers, and I just wanted to let me see if I can do it now. Can you see it now? No, we can't. Okay. Well, it's too bad. So uh, I just wanted to show. Uh, uh, the well-known comorbidities, which include cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, and hypertension. And I just wanted to mention that we are now thinking of a unifying link to these comorbidities. And that uh, really is obesity. Uh, more succinctly, from the metabolic point of view, it's not just the obesity, but the insulin resistance and the insulin-resistant related cytokines that might be heavily involved in the severity of COVID-19 and its complications. I also wanted to mention, unfortunately we can't see it, the most recent study published uh, just about a month ago, uh, a month ago on the genetic determinants of severe COVID-19 with respiratory failure. Some of you probably saw it in the New England Journal, but there are now two loci looking at the GWAS studies, uh, one on chromosome three, which shows there are six different succinct genes that may be involved with the severity of COVID-19, and the second one on chromosome nine, which is the ABO blood group. So it turns out that if you have group <laughs> A, then you have 45% increased risk of developing severe COVID-19, and if you're group O, then you have a 35% reduced risk of severity of COVID-19. So I think we might be able to predict uh, in the coming months to uh, uh, hopefully even earlier than many months from now, that we might be able to pre-select patients who might be able to more severity of the infection and prepare for them accordingly. <coughs> we have a lot of interest in looking at the genome as well as the insulin resistance put together to predict who might be at much greater increase of developing uh, severe COVID-19. And lastly, I wanted to mention, since uh, we're talking about uh, uh, global uh, Indian physicians and uh, the role they are playing in the treatment of COVID-19, that uh, as of uh, two weeks ago, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, there was a very interesting paper talking about the fact that uh, if you look at New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts in the United States, about 35 to 40 percent of all physicians are of international medical graduate uh, background, of which uh, more than 50% <coughs> are actually are from India. And unfortunately, we've already seen the role that uh, Indian physicians have played in sacrificing themselves and many of the mortality that has taken place among Indian physicians taking care of the sickest patients. So I think uh, with that, I just want to um, emphasize that we are going to have a fantastic program today and looking at the agenda, it seems like uh, the number of uh, agents that we're going to cover in the treatment of COVID-19 is really going to be a remarkable story and there's much more to come uh, as Dr. Sibyl mentioned. So my two minutes are up, Sibyl. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you so much. And you make a, a very important point about insulin resistance and obesity. And I think we learn a little bit more about uh, this condition. Uh, and thank you very much for highlighting the contribution of the global Indian physicians across uh, the globe. And in fact, the collaborative has put together a homage video, which is available on the GAPIO website, which recognizes the supreme sacrifice made by uh, Indian physicians uh, across several countries. It's a privilege now for me to introduce my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sudhakar Janalagada. He's a distinguished gastroenterologist and a transplant hepatologist based in Georgia. Uh, Sudhakar just took over as the president of the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin yesterday. Hardiest congratulations from all of us, Sudhakar, on taking on this responsibility. And we believe under your leadership, 
uh, Api will climb greater heights and of course this collaborative with the cooperation of Api uh, will become even stronger. Over to you Sudhakar. Thank you Sibel for a kind interaction and I'm um, really excited to be uh, present uh, took yesterday the summit has happened and uh, indeed you know this collaboration going very well since uh, the last four months. Uh, today I have a distinguished speaker Dr. Ram Gopala Krishnan Dr. Krishnan did his MD in internal medicine from Postgraduate Institute of Chandigarh, MRCP from UK, and a fellowship in ID from Wright State University, United States. Presented Dr. Ram is working as senior consultant in infectious disease in Apollo Hospital, Chennai, India. Ram is American board certified in internal medicine as well as infectious disease, certified in tropical medicine and travel and health of American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Ram is a fellow of uh, Infectious Disease Society of America and a fellow of European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease. Ram, currently a UN professor at MGR Medical University, Tamil Nadu, and Apollo Hospital Education Research Foundation. He published over 60 research papers, contributed chapters about five books, and delivered more than 200 invited lectures. Indeed, it is an honor to have Dr. Uh, uh, Krishna, and uh, he's going to speak on uh, Tocilizum up, and I know you all know that this IL6 is any better. And uh, over to Dr. Gopal Krishna. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I hope I am audible and I hope my slides are visible to all. Yes, for both. Okay, great. So let me go ahead. The topic I've been given today is Tocilizum app. And to be honest, when I looked at the program, I'm wondering why it started off with a machine gun. Uh -huh. They really should have been starting off with the uh, with the handguns and the pistols and stuff. So let me get on with it. And a few basics for all of you. Uh, you all know that IL-6 is a very, uh, is a, it's all over the place. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It affects most wings of the immune system. It is also actively produced in synovial and endothelial cells. That's why the previous applications in RA, importantly, it can be elevated in renal dysfunction. So when you assay these levels, keep that in mind. So this is just to show you that, uh, that tocilizumab is a humanized IL-6 receptor antagonist. So it actually blocks the binding of IL-6 to its receptor and consequently if it's working well, IL-6 levels should actually go up because it can't bind to its receptor to act. So this is an important point when you interpret levels when you assay IL-6. Now. Uh, this is what happens when, uh, when uh, th these are diseases for which uh, this drug has been used in the past. Uh, the most valuable indication is the cytokine release syndrome, which in itself is fairly recent after the onset of CAR T cell therapies. Giant cell arteritis, uh, RA, juvenile RA, these are all indications as well. But in all these diseases, it's been used over a period of time, over a period of weeks, say once a week or so. It's only in CRS related with CAR T therapy. If you have a situation analogous to an acute release of IL-6 where you can kind of extrapolate what we are doing with COVID right now. These are the doses of the drug. You can give 8 mg per kg per dose. So maximum of 800 in an obese individual. Typically, we give 400 in our, individual, in our Indian patients. We repeat it after 12 hours or so to maximize receptor soaking up. Uh, there is no real dose adjustment above creatinine clearance of 30. We really don't have good data under 30. I would think if you have a sick patient who needs it, I would go ahead. However, the drug can be hepatotoxic and therefore a word of caution not to use it in patients with decompensated liver disease. Similarly, check the counts before giving tocilizumab because counts can fall. And, uh, and neutropenia is probably a relative contraindications. You need to check hepatitis B serologies as well. And after you start this drug, monitor the counts for drug-induced cytopenias and certainly monitor LFTs. Uh, obviously, you would have already finished your infusions by the time the, the levels go up. Uh, there, is a, there is some concern about GI perforation or diverticulitis largely related to case reports from its use in RA. Uh, but certainly, everybody wants not to use it in the presence of cytopenia and in the presence of liver dysfunction. So these are the two major, uh, really relative contraindications to the use of this drug. What about pregnancy? We would advise you not to do it based upon the literature available in the past from RA. But if you have a sick pregnant woman who is in uh, so-called cytokine storm, then uh, perhaps the 
terrific outweighs the risk, especially later on in the pregnancy. Now, all of us agree that this drug leads to side effects in terms of an increased infection risk. Running through this list of organisms, you can see that uh, both, both T cell as well as B cell immunity may be affected. Both uh, fungal infections, bacterial infections, all of these get worse. And in, in the past literature, from the rheumatic literature, clearly there is at least a seven-fold increase in infection with tocilizumab. So certainly it is not free of major infection-related side effects. We've all seen this study, the very first study that came out in, uh, on tocilizumab, which got published in uh, PNAS, and it showed these pretty pictures of patients with bad CT scans who, who tended to improve after they got this drug. There were more studies from China, but again, without controls. So I won't pay a lot of attention to this kind of study. But really, the first large set of case series was from, was from Italy. Naturally, they were most severely affected among the Western countries. And you can see here that the results were kind of all over the place. The first study showed a possible benefit, very small numbers. The second on this slide was really equivocal. And the third really did not affect ICU admission. So these small retrospective studies are suggestive, but they didn't really guide us one way or the other. But the first study which uh, 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 shown in preprint form was this study from the US. It showed a 45% reduction in the in hazard of death. And also, despite a higher superinfection rate, they showed a higher superinfection rate, but it turned out the benefit from mortality was higher than the, the infection-related mortality in these patients. There were several more studies, all in preprint form. I don't want to go into the details except mention this large Spanish multicenter study which was published last month. It had more than uh, 10,000 person days and it did show a decreased risk of death and ICU admission or death. We're waiting to see this publication so we can see whether it really, really delivered on what the preprint promised. And all these single center studies show there is benefit a risk of secondary infection goes up. This is a good publication uh, published in uh, one of the Lancet journals. Um, again, decent study. It did have controls, uh, but the issue is all the study showed was that there was less vasopressor requirement and relatively small numbers, just 50 odd patients. It did not reduce the, the likelihood of progression to ventilator or make you less likely to die. And another retrospective study is published in CHEST. We're finally seeing publications, more patients, about 240 patients. Again, no real benefit. You know, there were some markers of improvement, etc., but really no clear benefit from this uh, larger retrospective study. But this is the biggest study on uh, tocilizumab published so far in Lancet Rheumatology. And I'll spend a couple of uh, minutes on this because this study clearly showed as I've uh, shown in that box, it reduced your likelihood of progression to invasive mechanical ventilation or death by 39%. And it did study pretty severe patients. This was the Tessio study from Italy. And you can see that they looked at uh, patients with clear cut ARPS uh, or who had lung infiltrates of more than 50%. Importantly, in this study, you did not have to have a high IL 6 to get into the study. And the most important exclusion criterion was that. If you were on steroids, you could not get into this study. So it's really a little difficult to, to kind of evaluate this in the current dexamethasone era, which really has become drug choice. These were the other exclusion criteria. About 1,300 odd patients who, uh, who, were, uh, uh, who were recruited into this study, 544 were finally eligible. And you can see here that these patients were also on a bunch of other therapies, which is always the bane of retrospective studies. We don't know what truly got them better. A lot of other drugs, we don't know whether they responded to these drugs or whether to the study drug. But the bottom line was they studied good endpoints, clinical endpoints, and showed an almost 40% reduction in the likelihood of severe outcomes. You can see here that the kaplan mayo curves are clearly split, whether you look at the uh, likelihood of progression to ventilator as well as death on the top two slides or uh, just uh, death in the bottom two slides. And interestingly, Subcutaneous tocilizumab did uh, uh, as well as intravenous tocilizumab. But there again, the infections pop up. You can see here that it's everything. It's candida, it's pneumocystis, it's bacterial. Uh, and these patients uh, really have two infections. No question about that. Statistically significant increase in, uh, in, in, in prevalence of secondary infections. 
and uh, so so clearly there's a problem with tocilizumab in terms of secondary infection so what this group of investigators uh, did was they, they started off with tocilizumab off the bat just like we're starting off in this seminar they started everybody on tocilizumab with steroids straight away they studied about 130 patients and you can see here that uh, uh, there was some benefit uh, in these patients uh, and uh, or 6 percent versus 34 uh, percent who did not benefit and so their conclusion was small study start both steroids and tocilizumab early now obviously these are the trials which are going to guide our practice in the ensuing uh, months this large covacta trial and more important tocilizumab is one of the arms of the recovery trial the trial that makes such a huge difference in practice today uh, just a word, uh, this, is, this is a level, this is a meta-analysis of IL-6 levels. And you can see here that IL-6 levels are clearly on the right side of the mean in patients uh, who have severe COVID. There's no question IL-6 levels are raised. Um, but but to, me, to, to, to me, looking at the literature, I would use it just like any other inflammatory marker. Oh, yes. I'm almost done. Last slide. No, uh, sorry, you couldn't see your last slide. Okay, so this is the meta-analysis of studies looking at IL-6 levels uh, and you can see here that they are all elevated in COVID. And uh, here, uh, and to me, I would use IL-6 levels just like any other inflammatory marker. Uh, certainly high levels don't predict response to tocilizumab. The largest study did not use IL-6 levels to recruit. They just looked at oxygenation and certainly not worth remeasuring because it's bound to go up if your drug has effectively worked. And just finally, to, to, to play the devil's advocate, is all this relevant at all? This, this lovely article uh, in the Lancet, uh, sorry, JAMA Internal Medicine, suggested that we are really not seeing a cytokine storm in COVID. For instance, in conventional ARDS due to sepsis, other causes, you see much higher levels. And certainly in CRS, which is what we're trying to mimic here, you see thousandfold higher levels of uh, IL-6. And if you look at the single cytokine interventions for the last 20 to 25 years in sepsis, they haven't really worked. So are we jumping the gun on, uh, on tocilizumab here? So based upon all this, this is what we do at Apollo Chennai. If somebody is worsening despite anticoagulation, steroids, antivirals, everything else, we give this agent, hopefully before they get on the ventilator. But just, uh, just yesterday, I had a patient, I started this uh, drug on, and I was, this patient was on empiric echinocandin and on echinocandin, candida grew in the blood. So it really messes up your uh, infection risk. So this is my final slide on tocilizumab. I would call it a two-edged sword. Uh, it is an IL-6 receptor antagonist. Uh, uh, this retrospective studies show benefit. Don't measure IL-6 at baseline to decide whether you're going to give this drug. Just go by how bad the patient is oxygenating. It clearly increases the risk for secondary infection. It is relatively expensive. And my take is I would uh, reserve it for severely hypoxemic patients not responding to steroids and other measures, and they're eagerly awaiting randomized controlled trial data. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much. Uh, one request, I don't know where the scribbles have appeared from everywhere. So somebody is using uh, something that they shouldn't be using because we are seeing all kinds of colors, which of course adds color to the presentation, but of course is disturbing. Thanks so much, Ramgopal, for an excellent presentation. Uh, and I have to acknowledge the fact that we at Apollo have now brought out version 21 of our guidelines. And uh, Ram uh, has played a stellar role in, in uh, looking at all the evidence and presenting this every uh, Friday or Saturday. Uh, now that we've uh, used the machine gun and we've used the most expensive machine gun, I think we'll come down to Mother Earth and go on to steroids. I use uh, something that we started using when we were interns. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Sudhakar and Ram for the first session and we move on. Uh, and I want to invite Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam. Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam is a distinguished uh, surgeon. He is the group medical director and CEO of Columbia Asia Hospitals. Uh, he served as the head of NABH, uh, head of uh, FIKI Healthcare, and is currently the vice president of GAPIO. Uh, over to Dr. Nand Kumar. Thank you, Anupam. Let me get along with the introduction of Dr. Girendra Sadera, uh, who is the next speaker. He graduated from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi and is currently working as consultant and research lead in critical care at Viral University Teaching Hospitals in the UK and has been in this position for the last 15 years. He has several international publications and involvement in multicentric national trials. 
Dr. Sadera. So, again, to go ahead and we'll move the slides for you. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you and your first slide is on. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I just want to make a slight uh, correction to that introduction before we start. I didn't graduate from all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. I was a senior resident and a consultant there. So I just thought I'd get that clear. Uh, I've been asked to talk about steroids. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to concentrate on dexamethasone. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the recovery study. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll probably talk about our experience as well. Now, we, we as you know, were pretty badly hit by COVID. Uh, I, I work in an 18 bedded intensive care unit, and uh, we had an overall case fatality which was similar to national figures, which was around 26%. Uh, it was around about one in three of every patient who was mechanically ventilated. So when we first started Remdesivir, we were very conscious of the fact that all it does is the shortest time to recovery. We didn't really have any agent which, which reduced mortality, which is why the recovery uh, trial was started. And as, as you know, the recovery trial has got a number of arms. One of the arms which I'm going to talk about is the steroid arm. If you can go to the next slide, please. If you can shift to the next slide, yeah, great, thanks. Uh, so in that, in that arm, you've got uh, two groups. One was dexamethasone, six milligrams once daily up for 10 days. And the other round was the usual care one. And the primary outcome was pretty straightforward, just 28 days mortality from randomization. Somebody seems to be using clip art again. I don't know who, who yeah, it is. But, uh, whoever's doing this, please stop this, please. Yeah. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, if we can shift to the next slide. Yeah, great. Now, uh, we had in, in this group, in the steroid group, there were around 2,000 uh, patients which were allocated to dexamethasone and over 4,000 to usual care. As you can see, uh, the majority were male. Uh, there were a number of people who had a comorbidity and over two thirds of the patients were, were either invasively or non-invasively ventilated or were on option. If you go to the next slide, please, that'll be great. Yeah, great. Now, as, as far as the results were concerned, what you can see, see straight away is that one third of the patients, the 20, day, the 20 day mortality was reduced in one third of the patients who received dexamethasone who were invasively ventilated. It went down to around about a fifth in those people who were not on oxygen. There wasn't any benefit, however, in patients who weren't on oxygen. Now, what they also saw in the dexamethasone group was that the uh, these, uh, the patients who benefited were around 10 years younger and they had had symptoms for around seven or eight days before they came to us. In the usual care group, uh, you can see those who didn't receive dexamethasone, the mortality was significantly higher in patients who were mechanically ventilated. In fact, it was more than 40%. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the next, yeah. Great. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, what was the uh, pathophysiology of all of this? Now, why, why, why seven days, and why? What was the uh, the indication for that? So, essentially, what they say is that viral shedding in COVID, unlike in SARS, if you can go back to that slide, sorry, viral shedding in COVID, unlike SARS, uh, happens in the first seven, seven, seven to eight days. And after that, it's inflammation. And that's why dexamethasone seems to work as an anti-inflammatory agent. Go to the next slide, please. Right, so essentially, the, the conclusion of the recovery trial was that dexamethasone, six milligrams, for up to 10 days, reduced the 28 mortality, 28 day mortality, yeah, from uh, randomization. So essentially, what you'd have to do is you'd have to treat eight patients in the mechanical ventilator group to prevent one death, and 25 patients in the auction group to uh, prevent one death. However, uh, surprisingly, there wasn't any benefit, and in fact, they found that there was possible harm in patients who weren't on auction. So as a result of this, if we could go to the next slide, please. 
As a result of this, the Department of Health issued certain guidelines which we are following. Essentially, we're using dexamethasone, six milligrams OD, in any patient who's uh, hospitalized, who requires either invasive or non-invasive option. We're not using it in children as yet. Uh, when we've got pregnant patients, we convert that to penicillin. Now, the dosage schedule, as you can see, we've got tablets, solutions, uh, IV, uh, that's, that's, that's more or less standard. The only thing is that if the patients are discharged within 10 days, we stop the treatment. So that's essentially uh, a sort of what, what's happening in a nutshell. We, apart from dexamethasone, as I'm sure all of you have, we've, we've, we've tried uh, methylprednisolone. All the patients who are on inotropes receive hydrocortisone as well. Uh, we're hoping that this uh, produces the same results we've seen in the Buffalo trial. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I've just added some references. If anyone's interested, uh, you can use these references. If you can't get them, just let me know and I'll, I'll be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, for sticking to time. Uh, um, and thank you, Dr. Nand Kumar, for, for moderating this session. So we move on to the next uh, session. And uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Sudhir Parekh. Dr. Sudhir Parekh is the chairman of uh, Parekh Worldwide Media. He's uh, uh, an expert in immunology and allergy and he is the vice president, uh, sorry, he's the secretary general of GAPIO, has been awarded with the Ellis Medal, the Pravasi Bharti Sri, and uh, night from uh, Malta. So over to Dr. Sudhir Parikh. Over to you, Dr. Sudhir Parikh. Sudhir Parikh, can you come in? Dr. Sudhir Parekh, please. Hear me? Yeah, now, hear? Yeah, now please go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> dear friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to GAPIO uh, COVID-19 uh, webinar. It's a very successful webinar for the last two months. And really, uh, the physician all over the world has enjoyed this uh, webinar very much. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Pawan uh, Bhat Raju. Dr. Pawan Bhat Raju is an pro assistant professor in the Division of the Pulmonary uh, Critical Care and the Sleep Medicine at the University of Washington. Dr. Pawan is the, uh, part of the group who was pioneer in uh, publishing uh, US COVID-19 cases uh, in New England Journal of Medicine early enough. Dr. Pawan is uh, also co-principal investigator in study where they collected biological specimens from the very ill COVID-19 patients to understand the molecular mechanism of the disease. Let's welcome and hear Dr. Pawan Padraju. Welcome, Dr. Raju. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to present. This is particularly exciting because um, growing up, my father is a surgeon, and so we would attend OPI events often. And so it's um, exciting to be able to present to this group. I'm going to briefly be talking about the historical precedent of using convalescent plasma and the limited data currently available for this um, therapy. So on the left, you see a schematic of whole blood. And after centrifugation, plasma is the milky fluid that's found in the blood. This contains immunoglobulins as well as other factors. So the, the mechanism of action is to think that after someone is recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infection, to collect their plasma and then administer it to patients um, with COVID-19 infection to prevent or treat the um, current infection using the neutralizing viral antibody. Currently, this is FDA approved in the US through an investigational and an emergency IND. Convalescent plasma for the treatment of infectious diseases has been used since the early 20th century and was associated with reduced mortality during the 1918 influenza pandemic, the 2003 SARS CoV 1, as well as the 2009 influenza H1N1 pandemic, 
However, most of the published studies of these diseases were case series and retrospective comparisons of treated versus non-treated individuals. Despite this, because of the encouraging results, there's been precedence to use this in COVID-19. There's been a handful of different case series that have been published in COVID-19, but I really want to focus on um, the largest uh, randomized control trial currently available. So this, um, this study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in June 2020. Um, the investigators were from China, and the expected sample size for this study was to be um, greater than 200 patients. However, the investigators said that because of the pandemic was under control in China, they were unable to enroll patients, and so they stopped at 103 patients. Half of the patients were randomized to the convalescent plasma group, and half of the patients were in the control arm. As you can see from the table one demographics, the average age was 70 year old or older. And as can be seen in most case series of COVID-19, coexisting diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases were common. And one of the things to note about this in the previous pandemics when convalescent plasma was used, such as SARS-CoV-1 or influenza, it was mostly used in a younger patient population and earlier during hospitalization. In this randomized control trial, each patient had an average symptom duration of 30 days or longer prior to getting enrolled in the study. So it was mostly used in a later in the disease. It's also important to note that many of these patients received other therapies, everything from antivirals, antibacterials, steroids, as well as antifungals. So it's challenging to know exactly if the results are due to convalescent plasma or from these other therapies. Their primary outcome, so um, on the left here is the cumulative improvement rate is the percentage of patients who experienced a two-point improvement or were discharged alive from the hospital. And so you can, as you can see from these two Kaplan-Meier curves, there is no statistically difference between the placebo group versus the convalescent plasma group. But I think one thing that um, to notice is that in subgroup analyses, these are um, smaller patient populations because the study in general was underpowered. But it looks like there may be um, a trend toward improvement in the patients with less severe disease. So on the panel on the left here, you can see the convalescent plasma group had um, a statistically improved outcome. But then on the panel C, um, these are patients who are critically ill in the intensive care unit. There's no difference. Another um, um, takeaway from this study is that they looked at viral nucleic acid negative rate. And so um, here they um, did PCR to see COVID-19 infection at 24 hours, 48 hours, as well as 72 hours. And you can see the convalescent plasma group um, at 24 hours, almost 47 or 44% of the patients had um, negative PCR compared to the control group, whereas 15%. And these differences persisted throughout um, the first 72 hours, potentially suggesting that convalescent plasma is allowing for a clearance of the viral infection. The two main concerns that we have with convalescent plasma are issues of transfusion-related lung injury, as well as transfusion-related circulatory overload. In this study by um, colleagues in uh, Lee et al. and colleagues in JAMA, they found that there is um, they didn't describe either of these two side effects. And from our local experience, we've um, given this therapy to a handful of patients and we found no, um, no rates of ACE side effects. So in conclusion, convalescent plasma is likely to be safe, but studies are limited. The plasma may improve outcomes in select patients, but it's really a challenge of understanding who the right patients are and what the time period to give. An early use of convalescent plasma may lead to larger benefits than later use. And then I just want to end by saying there's over 26 randomized control trials currently underway in, um, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, and so I think there's going to be a lot more that's coming out about the use of this therapy. Thank you. Anupam, you're muted. You're muted. Okay. Hey, thanks, Pavan, and uh, thanks, Sudhirbhai. And uh, a very nice presentation, and clearly a lot of information that we need, uh, lots of unanswered questions about when to use precisely, and hopefully the RCTs will 
shed light just like that uh, paper on 20,000 plasma uh, therapies uh, shed light on the safety. We move on uh, and, and to the next uh, session and uh, it's a privilege to invite uh, Dr. Balareddy. Dr. Balareddy is a member of the Executive Committee of CAPIO and uh, has been the Secretary and President of the Andhra Pradesh Private Hospitals and Nursing Home Association. He's a distinguished physician. Over to Dr. Balareddy. Dr. Balareddy, please come in. Dr. Balareddy, can you please come in? Yeah, Dr. Balareddy, please. Yeah. yeah please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sibyl. Let me introduce Dr. Green, who is a consultant uh, at uh, the Hormones Education Specialist. He's a board of medical medicine, medical medicine and critical care medicine. Dr. Sai is a medical director of Apollo. He acts in the ICU specialist. Can I come on to the Thanks so much. Over to you, over to you, Sai. Hi, uh, this is Sai Arnath. Abala, can you go, please mute yourself? There is a disturbance at your end. Are my slides visible? Yeah, please go ahead, Sai. Okay, hi. hi thanks to the Balaradi. Thanks, Anupam. Uh, again, uh, welcome to all the 900 plus people from around the world, some of you in Australia staying up for us, and some of you spending Sunday morning with us. And of course, all of us in India, thank you very much for joining. I think uh, we have, you know, looking for the uh, treatment and looking for solutions to all our patients, and they are fairly desperate looking for new things, and Savi Theravir is the new kid on the block. And one of the questions that everybody is asking is, is it worth the effort and the money? I understand why as I go through this brief session. Now, one of the issues that we need to realize is that uh, an antiviral is definitely it's not a new antiviral. It was used in Japan for several years now for uh, influenza. In addition, it was used in Africa for the Ebola crisis. And there are many trials going on. That's a picture from clinical trials of Dow showing you all the studies going on around the world right now using Saviteravir in various combinations. So there is a fair amount of research that is going on. Unfortunately, many of these trials have not yet started. Only some of them have started. Only two or three have actually finished. And of them, the Bangladesh RCT Dhaka trial, as they call it, finished yesterday. And I uh, didn't make my slides uh, for a while. And, uh, and you know, one of the things that I realized was that a lot of the data is coming out in the media and in preprint and is not yet come in publications yet. But of this group, they had 25 treatment groups and 25 placebo groups. It uh, looks like they stuck to the protocol that was released on clinical trials. They also noticed there was a viral clearance by day four and half the patients in the treatment arm and almost 96% by day 10. About 44% had uh, more lung function than placebo. Uh, actually, uh, lung clearance than placebo, and our lung function improved about three times more than placebo. And uh, now, this is a very tiny trial if you think about it. Just 25 people actually got the drug. So it's really unclear if this effect will be seen in a larger scale. Now, anecdotally, I've been asking the friends around on the various groups, are you using it? And what I've heard is several people are using it, but if you look at the exclusion criteria for this trial, pretty much anybody who's sick is not going to get it. Now, there are some RCTs going on in the US and the UK. There are several open label trials in France, Turkey, and Iran, and these are completing in 2020 and 2021. Now, the way that Savi Therapia works is it, uh, you know, tries to incorporate itself. So as the virus enters in, it gets, uh, uncoated and then it gets into the, uh, cellular mechanism and Savi Therapia blocks the RNA dependent RNA polymerase enzyme and incorporates itself and kind of puts a stop to the replication. Now, the virus is actually pretty smart, but this particular drug incorporates itself in a particular place where it cannot compete. And what you would see is that the ultimately the viral replication is affected and you actually get a, a decrease in the viral uh, release. The next component is a trial that has come out in critical care last month in end of June. And they actually showed an interesting thing where they started the favicidavir around uh, day four or so. 
uh, I mean, the, uh, the day one. And then they started measuring all these things. About day four after the favorite for administration, they noticed inflammatory markers coming on. IL-6 came down, uh, plasma uh, came down, the PS improved. Now, incidentally, I mean, they didn't stress on in the article. If you look at the article, the steroids were started right about this time. So people got steroids uh, right around the time that these numbers started coming down. So I have a feeling this is more a steroid effect rather than a direct antiviral effect. Another trial, which was again from Japan, showed that a combination of this drug called neptomostat, this works on a particular enzyme, a uh, serine protease enzyme, and it's used in actually acute pancreatitis. They combined this drug with favipiravir and again showed in a case series that there were many discharges. Again, this is just anecdotal information, and this is a very observational trial. Some of them are retrospective, so the data isn't clear, but they showed that some patients got home early. Again, the exclusion criteria were if you are sick, you didn't get in. Now, there are some case reports from Thailand and Turkey. There is one from Thailand where there are renal transplant patients who got a combination of tocilizumab where they actually had an improvement in the pneumonia. Likewise, another case report from another country where the patient did not survive. So you're you know, getting all these stream of information and you know, what is the conclusion? What do you actually do? India, actually, they have completed some studies. The data from the Indian study is not yet available. I looked till yesterday, and in fact, today I could not find the actual data released from the current trial. It was an observational, open-label trial. Uh, there was a no real randomization as such. It was done on very mild patients. If you are even on non-invasive ventilation or in the ICU, you are not eligible. Pregnant women cannot. So there are about three open-label trials going on at this time. And the data should be coming out soon, but uh, the, the numbers are not gigantic. They are going on in several centers, though. Now, what is the complete conclusion of this data? Now, Russia, Japan have shown some benefit. India, there's anecdotal data saying it may be beneficial. However, they use all, all these trials with very obsolete comparators. Many of them use the uh, HIV antivirals, and they're not using them anymore. It is unknown if the natural history of viral clearance is accelerated. Maybe that's the only thing that's going on. And the RT-PCR test coming negative, I'm not sure what the implication of that is, whether you can conclude quarantine sooner or not, because really you don't know if you're still having viral shedding or not. And lastly, will it impact antibody formation? If you don't have the virus, will your body make antibodies? What is the implication of that? So there are some side effects of this drug. These include a uric acid elevation. You should get a baseline uric acid and not use it in somebody who has gout. Some people get diarrhea. And with other drugs, watch the QPC. Uh, there have been anecdotal reports of bradycardia from colleagues who have been using this drug. This drug has been shown to be teratogenic and embryo uh, has uh, issues on the embryo. So if they are pregnant, you should not use it. Uh, the conclusion, it is expensive. It is not cheap. Uh, the benefit is unclear, perhaps similar to how various influenza treatments are there. I think we should wait for the data to come out before we use it more widespread for sicker patients. If you want to use it, please review the dose. It's a lot of pills to swallow. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. So the, the conclusion is, Favipiravir, more to come. Keep an eye out on whether it's beneficial or not. As of now, most people I know are not using it, is what I've heard, especially in sicker patients. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. Valeridi. Thanks so much, Sai. Uh, we move on to the next session, and it's a privilege to introduce uh, Anupama uh, Kotimukola to moderate this session. Anupama is a pediatric anesthesiologist and in Texas at San Antonio. San Antonio, and she's currently the Vice President of API and the President-Elect of API for 21-22. So over to you, Anupama. Thank you, Anupam, for the kind introduction. So we, we took over yesterday evening. Uh, so I'm the current President-Elect for API now, from today. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very happy to introduce a very good speaker today, very young and dynamic. Dr. Pooja Shah, uh, she is an infectious disease specialist practicing in New Jersey, USA. And Dr. Pooja completed her internal medicine residency at Seton Hall University in New York and obtained her fellowship from Eastern Carolina University in North Carolina. She was the principal investigator for the expanded access program with Gilead involving the drug Remdesivir at Hackensack University Hospital at JFK University Hospital, New Jersey. Pooja, welcome. We would like to hear from you more about this drug and remdesivir during this phase of COVID now, and it's your turn. Thank you for having me. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for having me today. Um, I'm going to talk about Introduction. So, you know, this is an inhibitor of the viral RNA dependent. 
in RNA polymerase. Uh, random severe showed in vitro that it can inhibit the replication of the um, SARS-CoV-2. It's still an investigational drug manufactured by Gilead, and there's still ongoing research about the drug. Now, uh, random is actually initially was used to be for Ebola when Ebola first came out. Um, it had limited effect, but it showed that it was safe to use in um, humans. That's what came out of that. Um, so what's the criteria to in initiate remdesivir? Obviously, you have to have a positive SARS-CoV infection. It's used for hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 disease, which is defined as um, your saturation less than 94% on room air, requiring supplement oxygen, their nasal cannula or high flow, or being on a, vent a mechanical ventilation or requiring ECMO. You have to have a GFR greater than 30 mils per minute, and your uh, liver enzymes, ACALT, has to be within five times upper normal limit before um, starting. When to discontinue random severe? Um, when your ALT is greater than or equal to five times upper normal. However, if the enzymes start to start to come down, you can always restart the drug, which is a good thing. Um, or when you see ALT elevation accompanied by other um, liver inflammation like elevated bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, or the INR. Um, some people have been reported to have a hypersensitive reaction and if their GFR drops below 30. Um, some side effects that have been noted is the liver enzyme elevation, some GI disturbances, uh, infusion reaction like nausea, sweating, and low blood pressure, and there's still ongoing research about other side effects that have to be studied. So I'm just going to go more in my experience with the drug. So like you said, I am the um, principal investigator uh, for the expanded access program with Gilead. So basically, this program was set for our intubated patients with the strict criteria, and that means they would have to be off pressors, their GFR was greater than 30, AC, ALT within five times the normal limit, and they had to be intubated. But with that, when patients are intubated, their mortality was already starting up at a high mortality from the beginning. So we enrolled about 62 patients, um, and our hospital was mostly males, that we had, and majority of our patients were on steroids from the beginning. Um, as for other treatments for COVID, while during this, um, while in the remdesivir, they could not receive any other treatments. It was either prior to starting or after, and they did complete a 10-day course during this process. Um, our outcome mostly was we had about 23% of our patients come off the ventilator, which is good given that the mortality is already high from the beginning once they're intubated. So we did see some good outcomes. Um, the one thing we noticed with our intubated patients actually was that a lot of them went into renal failure. And so once I realized that this was happening, we actually started giving pre and post boluses with fluids and that helped with the renal function. And also when people's renal functions were between 30 to 40 of their GRFR, we were very cautious about starting and make sure we bolus them just to prevent. Because once they go into renal failure, we noticed our patients were not doing very well. So we try to do everything to help prevent things that we could for these patients. Um, we also noticed a lot of our elderly patients didn't do well. It could be because of comorbidities, but there's so much still that needs to be researched into this. But that was just our general experience that we saw with that. With that, then um, in the U.S., they ended up having remdesivir become emergency use of remdesivir by our FDA. So with that experience, it allowed us to give remdesivir to our non-intubated patients. And the criteria at that time was that it had to be 94% saturation, GFR, again, above 30, ACLT, five times within normal, and they had to be within 10 days of diagnosis of the COVID infection. Um, we, use, we actually have a small sample size of just 27 patients, mostly males. During the emergency use, we use mostly uh, five-day duration instead of 10 days. But something we learned is that sometimes you can give a lot. If you need to give 10 days, we gave it for our intubated patients or the ones that were more sick. Um, and we had about 70% complete the course, which is good. But the one thing we noticed more, that people are having more liver failure with when we use the emergency use. So that's why you have to watch your patients carefully in the labs. The main thing out of all this, we noticed with remdesivir, early is the better. If you can use any treatments early is better, mostly. Um, we actually started doing giving plasma first, and then we would give our patients remdesivir. You know, remdesivir is one of the antivirals that brings sorry, down... Can you put your slides are not moving. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Um, okay. That we know that it brings it down, the, um, to help bring patients down. So we would try to space out all our treatments. So if you give plasma, telizumab, or remdesivir, try to plasma 
space them out by 12 hours at least if you can just so you don't know because you don't know if there's co-interaction with any of these treatments so we try to be more cautious and monitor your labs closely and the good thing about remdesivir if the labs are abnormal you can watch them and then you can always restart the drug as well and um it does help with the length of stay it does bring down the recovery in adults it was mentioned in the new jersey um, sorry, New England Journal of Medicine, that the take home message for this is it shortens the time to recovery in adults hospitalized with COVID-19. And the last thing I want to say is timing is very important. The earlier, the better for all these COVID-19 patients. And we did use steroids in all our patients as well. Thank you so much, Pooja. That was uh, a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation that you managed in five minutes. Thanks ever so much. And thanks, Anupama. Uh, as always, for being such a pillar and hearty congratulations on taking over as president elect. We are now going to move on to our last session, and uh, we're going to have um, Dr. Agam Bora as the speaker. And to introduce him, we have Dr. Anju Agarwal. Anju is a family physician in Australia and uh, has been the secretary and the vice president of the uh, Australian Indian Medical Graduates Association. So over to you, Anju. Anju, can you please come in? Unmute him. Or she is not mute, unmuted. Please unmute yourself. Anju, please go ahead. Go ahead, Anju, we can't hear you. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks, Anju. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker who is uh, speaking about IPCW, uh, Dr. Agam Bora. Dr. Agam uh, is in charge of Department of Chest and TB at Dr. R. N. Cooper Municipal General Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Agam is ex-assistant professor of Department of Chest and TB at KJ Somaya Medical College, Mumbai. And Dr. Agam is assistant editor of Journal of Association, Physician of uh, India and editorial board member of Chest TB. Is president of Geriatric Society of India and is General Secretary of Academy of Advanced Medical Education. With this introduction, please welcome Dr. Agam Vora. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Madam, for those uh, nice words of introduction. I'm grateful to all of you and the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin and the who chose uh, to be with us on this Sunday evening uh, in India and uh, of course at different times of the day in the rest of the part of the world. COVID uh, has brought the world to stand still. I never imagined that a small 100 nanomicron virus would change our life and the whole existence would be at stake. Last six months, thought of thought neurology better, we realized consequences of COVID and we have realized now COVID moves in a different pattern. It is a two-fold disease. The earlier part is due to viral multiplication. And Agam, can you please uh, share your slides? And also, there seems to be a slight uh, hum in your audio. Agam, can you uh, come in, please, with uh, slightly better audio and share your slides? Am I audible? I'm sorry. Yeah, audible. You, you please start your slides. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, specific antivirals are recently made available, and that were not freely available. We can't see your slides, Agam. Yeah. 
that led us to explore various immunomodulators. Uh, it's not seen. No, please uh, go on to share screen because it initially was, but then it went away. Oh, okay, okay. Great. Somebody's got their. In absence, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. And in absence of uh, specific entry retrovirus, most of, most of us started using uh, various immunomodulators. Uh, immunomodulators has always been very interesting uh, you know, topic. We don't much know about immunomodulators. We don't. We don't much understand about immunity. And anything that modulates immunity, in my opinion, is immunomodulator. And hence, a paracetamol tablet that you take could be immunomodulator. A vaccine could be immunomodulated and, and various herbal mineral drugs that we've tried over decades could be immunomodulators. With that, let me come down to the point of discussion today, that is roll of Sepsivac in the COVID-19 as the immunomodulator. What is this Sepsivac? Before I begin that, I must thank my teacher, late Professor Director Dr. K.C. Mohanty, of course all of you, Dr. Anju, Dr. Sibyl, Dr. Tandon, education partners and of course all delegates. This mycobacterium W, or also known as mycobacterium indices prani, it is a saprophytic non-pathogenic strain of mycobacterium and which acts as immunomodulator. And it is known to contain multiple antigens. Each 0.1 ml of uh, sepsivac would contain 0.5 into 10 days to 9 bacilli, which are hit killed. And this is truly what our Prime Minister wants. It is Atma Nirbhar Bharat. This is developed by India. It is developed by CSISR and the Cadilla Pharmaceutical together. It's a joint effort. It is not a new molecule. It is not a new uh, immunomodulator. We know about this immunomodulator for at least one and a half decade. It is already approved by DCGI for the treatment of leprosy and also for advanced non-small cell lung cancer as immunomodulator. Recently, it was also approved by uh, approved for sepsis, mainly gram-negative sepsis adjuvant therapy to the standard ongoing treatment. The study was done at uh, Chandigarh. We have also explored its uh, role as immunomodulator, and these are the proposed mechanism. When given, when given through intradermal route, it is to be given through intradermal route. It acts as a potent agonist against TLR2 receptor at the same time having only poly TLR activity, which is antagonistic in nature. That means it has an agonist actin on TLR2 and various other TLR receptors that is antagonist. It downregulates P38 and that causes suppression of cytokines. One of the gene expression related to 20 different pro inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Study conducted to observe the effect of sepsivac on various genes have shown that in patients with gram-negative sepsis, where cytokine, where you know in COVID-19 also the similar cytokine storms are seen. After administration of sepsivac, all genes which were upregulated previously are now downregulated, and all those genes which were downregulated are upregulated. In this way, it establishes the immune homeostasis in patients with dysregulated immune response. This is what I was trying to tell you about. This data shows that list of genes downregulated because of FCVAC induced genes related to all potent pro-inflammatory cytokines, like as you can see in these slides, IL-4, IL-5, IL-2, and IL-12, also TNF-alpha and, uh, and, and IFN-gamma. And hence we can I think it was muted. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. 
Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I think again, uh, these slides are lost. This is uh, what I was trying to tell you about the study which was uh, done at uh, PJ Chandigarh, and this was talking about the efficacy of sepsivac in gram negative infection, gram negative sepsis. And it was conducted at 13 different centers with 202 patients, about 100 patients in each arm, with primary objective to evaluate the efficacy of uh, sepsivac and reducing 28 days mortality in patients with sepsis. And as you can see in this slide, there was a distinct advantage in mortality, the percentage death, which were reduced due to, in the sepsivac treated arm. The dose which was given is 0.3 ml of duct to be injected per day at a time intradermally, three different sites for three days. And this is the dose which is approved for gram negative sepsis in. You can see this in this slide how COVID 19 and cytokines interact, and how this particular uh, molecule that is uh, a Mycobacterium vecchi or Mycobacterium W brings about immunomodulation. In sepsivic arm. In COVID, the release of inflammatory cytokines are mainly because of binding of the spike proteins on TLR4 receptors. You can see that there are spike proteins, the envelope proteins, and then there is a genome, which is RNA. This particular spike proteins bind on TLR4 receptors on the surface of macrophage. This particular surface, you can see that there is TLR receptor, the AS proteins binds there, and it brings about cascade of inflammation and various pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, TNF-alpha, gamma, all are released. Uh, Adam, I just wanted to remind you that we are sticking to time, so you don't have that much time. Yes, I, I, will, I will wind up in no time. Uh, this particular slide talks about the upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory cytokines. It brings about mortality predictors based on analysis of 150 patients from Wuhan. This study came and it speaks about in dysregulation of cytokines and cytokine responsibility in mortality. This was also a study from there which speaks about the potential solution to suppress this pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines, which would bring about mortality advantage. And this is probably the level at which there is a proposed mechanism where this particular molecule, that is Mycobacterium W, acts. Looking at difference between the action between tocilizumab and this, probably this is molecule which is working at the level of macrophage where the production of interleukin-6 is inhibited. Tocilizumab may be a IL-6 inhibitor where the production is not really inhibited, whereas with Mycobacterium W, that is Mycobacterium uh, W brings about the TLR antagonism, P36 downregulation and gene downregulation bringing about reduction in the cytokine storm. It is a potent inducer of Th1 response when given intradermally activates macrophages which are responsible for viral load clearance. Looking at it, probably there was a report published in Lung India where PGI Chandigarh, they studied this particular molecule in the clinical critical condition and found to be safe. And in Karnataka, government has prepared a, a treatment protocol and they've included this in moderate to severe kind of uh, cases of COVID-19. There are three ongoing trials, which, which is trying to look at the effect of Mycobacterium W in critically ill COVID patients. Uh, the second trial is looking at uh, patients who are at risk of developing in, uh, infection with COVID-19. And third one is looking at hospitalized patients who are non-critical. And I'm very happy to say that more than 100 patients were already enrolled in this study. To conclude, I would say one could explore, one could look at the use of sepsivac, both as primary and secondary prophylaxis, and there may be uh, understanding where we may be looking at uh, uh, treatment with Mycobacterium W for treatment of cytokine storm in mild to moderate cases of COVID-19, for treatment of critically ill patients with COVID-19 with sepsis, and there are trial plans to understand the role of this particular molecule in prophylaxis of COVID-19 infection prevention. If I have to give you my experience, I have used it 15 years ago in the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis. That time we did not have clear understanding of MDR tuberculosis and XDR tuberculosis. Currently, I've used it for 12 hospitalized patients of COVID, proven COVID. I have taken it myself and I've given it to all my friends, including Dr. Mangesh Tivaskar, Dr. Jayesh Dele, Dr. Suraj Suchak, Vigil, and a uh, you know, few RMOs and few of my friends. I, on average, see about 20 patients of COVID confirmed and about few suspected daily. 
and my last igg which was done yesterday was negative so probably it may be helping uh, us and there may be time to explore it role primary and secondary prevention thank you very much thank you very much agam uh, this is uh, this has been a very uh, educative session about a molecule that not very many uh, are familiar with uh, so we the slide share so we come to a very exciting day and this is going to be about the journey and we have two very experienced uh, um, experts who are going to be leading the session we have dr rajesh chavla who is a senior consultant in respiratory and critical care at apollo delhi he's been the past president of the indian society of critical care medicine and we have dr ram subramaniam in chennai senior consultant in infectious diseases in uh, apollo chennai um, trained at uh, pgi and overseas and uh, both of them have uh, Uh, played a very important role in creating the Apollo guidelines that we issue every week. The way we want to run this, we're going to do this for 20 minutes. Uh, so Rajesh and Ram, please note 20 minutes, and we're going to go molecule by molecule. So we're going to start with tocilizumab, then go to steroids, plasma, pepivir, remdesivir, and mycobacterium W. So we're going to request uh, the speakers who spoke on 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 that particular molecule to unmute themselves as uh, the Q and A starts uh, for their particular molecule, and then please. Mute yourself, and over to uh, Rajesh and Ram. Good evening, uh, Rajesh here. You know, I'll ask question first for the tocilizumab to Dr. Ram Gopal Krishnan. You know, we've been hearing lot of drugs over last four months. There was nothing, and we have lot many drugs. This is probably the question I am going to ask uh, many of the speakers. How do you go about it in a critically ill patient? You know, we have remdesivir, we have dexamethasone. Tocilizumab and plasma. So, Ram, uh, it's question to you: What therapy you start first in a critically ill patient, or let's say a person who is hypoxic? Uh, thank you, Rajesh. So, the first therapy I would start is dexamethasone, simply because that is one study which has clearly shown a reduction in mortality in a randomized controlled trial. Second, I would add prophylactic low molecular weight heparin for most patients. In fact, all patients. and i would even give higher doses of perhaps even therapeutic anticoagulation if i can't rule out a pre existing thrombotic event thirdly i would give remdesivir provided the patient is not yet ventilated because the data clearly shows that it doesn't help once you end up on the ventilator and there is perhaps modest benefit in reducing time in the icu etc without a mortality benefit if you are not yet on the ventilator so that is my my so that's my order of prescription in the average covid patient in somebody who is not responding to 1 2 and 3 i would give tocilizumab and i have become increasingly more reluctant to give this drug because of the side effects of the drug in terms of uh, secondary infection all it seems to do is it maybe helps acutely but the patients hang on in the icu for days sometimes weeks and end up with secondary sepsis so Uh, in order of, uh, of uh, importance, uh, steroids. Secondly, anticoagulation. Third, antivirals, and finally, tocilizumab. So you don't like the plasma? Is, is there a reduction in the second dose, uh, or what is the maximum dose you given for tocilizumab? Uh, I give eight hundred, four hundred stat, and twelve hours uh, later, I would give uh, a second dose of four hundred. Uh, your question on plasma. Uh, there is absolutely no data that plasma works the the speaker on plasma would i'm sure take that up the single randomized controlled trial showed no benefit the benefit from plasma you need to give it in the first 7 days before antibodies form and a big european study showed that the majority of patients who present with severe covid already have antibodies you're okay. just wasting your time giving plasma so i'm waiting okay. for that so the last question to you you know it's about il6 you know people at all over centers unless the il6 is high 8 to 10 times they would not give tocilizumab is it really necessary to do an il6 number one be short and the other or you should not use it if it is not available you should not run for il6 that's number two and the third at its economic cost is the tocilizumab really useful you partially answered but be brief because then we go to the next segment Yeah, I would treat IL-6 just like a rich man's CRP, LDH, etc. D-dimer is really the one biomarker we should be doing. If it is high, I would not base a decision on giving tocilizumab. I would look at the oxidation. That is what the largest single study which I presented showed. 
And finally, I believe prostaglandinum is costly, but I am reluctant to use it mainly because of the secondary infection risk. That is my biggest concern. Thank you. Over to Ram, Dr. Ram Subramaniam for the next section. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, for people who can't see me, I'm actually uh, uh, logged in through Aruna Mohan, my wife. I apologize. Uh, good evening, everybody. We have had a good session. And my questions are to Dr. Sadera. Uh, there is a lot of evidence in India. I know the recovery trial is uh, using dexamethasone, but a lot of people in India seem to prefer solumedrol. Uh, have you uh, used solumedrol? What are your views on using solumedrol instead of dexamethasone? So we essentially, we started with uh, methyl prednisolone and hydrocortisone. And when the recovery trial uh, came in, and when, when, when we were instructed about the bar, we switched over to dexamethasone. So actually, these are, the, these are the only three drugs we've used as far as steroids are concerned. Uh, methyl prednisolone, when we started using it, we were essentially using it when nothing else was working. So we had patients who had been uh, prone and unproned maybe two or three times. They were basically at death store, and then we started uh, one milligram per kg PT uh, for a few days. It worked in a few patients. Uh, the thing, the thing is, you know, the recovery trial. Our patients, when they come in, they they essentially uh, dexamethasone has already been started on them because they come to us from the respiratory ward. Uh, so essentially, these are the three drugs we we've, we've, we've got experience with. Three steroids we've got experience with. And, uh, as such, I think after we started dexamethasone, we have seen better results. Definitely. Having said that, in the new what we're seeing now is that we're on a we're on a downward trend, unlike in India. Uh, we hardly have, in fact, we don't have any COVID positive patients on the unit at present. And the last uh, the last patient in the hospital was around three days ago. So I think I think you you're probably going to reap the benefits more than than us. Right. What about, there seems to be a potential uh, interaction between remdesivir and uh, dexamethasone. Uh, do you think it makes a difference in uh, real life? It's difficult to say. We Toward the end, we were using remdesivir and uh, dexamethasone. Both. The problem is, what what we do, a lot of it depends upon the, uh, the, the arms of the trials we're actually in. So we had the recovery trial. And for intensive care patients, we had the remap cap trial. So depending upon which arm the patient was in. We did towards the end start using remdesivir and dexamethasone. By that time, we we were starting starting to get really good results. Now, who knows whether it was due to dexamethasone or whether it was due to remdesivir? It's difficult to say. What about is there a different dose used in pregnancy? Uh, pregnant women have you used steroids? Uh, so, in we we as such, we we didn't have a pregnant woman on our unit. But according to the recovery trial, what they say is you've got to switch over to prednisolone uh, instead of using dexamethasone. I don't have the, I can get you the dosage schedule. I don't have it with me now, but I'm sure I can get it. Uh, lastly, briefly, do you think there is a role for steroids in an outpatient scenario? That is, before he gets admitted, do you think steroids can prevent uh, hospitalization or ensure that hospitalization is minimized? Okay. <laughs> Again, uh, we we have very strict rules on what we can do and what we can't do. So dexamethasone for us in COVID, uh, we are only allowed to prescribe it when the patient is hospitalized. I'm not sure. I think, uh, I suppose, I I personally don't see any harm. But but at the end of the day, we, we have to go according to what, what the guidelines are. So that's just how it is. Thank you very much. Over to you, Rajesh. Thank you. Okay, so before Ram, Ram and Rajesh and uh, uh, Dr. Sadera and Ram Gopal Krishnan, any one of you can answer this. This is really a very important question because uh, there is a group in the US that's advocating use of steroids in outpatients. And I know there is no trial. And I don't even know if such a trial is going to be possible now. But, you know, what do you say conceptually? And, and this group believes and, and they've been posting on, on, on this group that, you know, if you actually did that and not worry too much about viral replication, you would actually prevent hospitalization, which is really the goal. So anyone wants to comment on that? And I know there is no data and I'm, I'm asking this question conceptually. Okay, I can take that if you want. Um, uh, see, the issue with COVID is we don't have a good antiviral. We definitely don't have a good antiviral for severe disease. And we don't have a good antiviral 
like say oseltamivir for influenza for mild to moderate disease so if you're not giving an antiviral to a patient who has active viral replication and you give steroids the concern is things will get worse so i am not in favor of giving steroids without a concomitant antiviral i would rather wait for clinical data from someone showing that that approach works you know the other thing is anupam we have so far bed we availability is not an issue all across india so i think if a person there is an indication of giving steroid better to admit and give under supervision like ram said i think we should not indulge because every patient would be receiving and we may see complications which are not being seen now okay so i i mean that's very helpful so what you guys are saying is we don't have an antiviral so you really want to hedge with remdesivir is what you are saying and do that in a hospitalized uh, environment till we actually get some data and i just hope some data comes on the outpatient setting over to you uh, rajesh you know these are the question for plasma you know because plasma did not get that attention the ram ramakrishna ram gopalakrishnan said that he doesn't like it so let me ask you question what are the indication of repeat plasma let's go a little ahead and what is the gap between the first and the second dose how oh. so so in uh, thank you for that question in our experience we rarely ever give repeat plasma and so often what we do is the first dose of plasma if we can give is earlier during hospital admission we can check um antibody titers in the recipients patients receiving the plasma but we don't often do that because it doesn't influence our management after we give a dose of plasma that's usually it we um are not giving a second dose so what is the and dose you are giving how many so it's, it's um usually 200 to 400 ml of volume um you you could get a smaller volume from that um but um and then that is just an iv transfusion there's minimal side effects we see but as the speakers have said before this is usually a third or fourth line therapy we offer and it's often challenging because <clears throat> consent is required um it's an investigational drug therapy and so the other therapies that have been um talked about are earlier given and more prioritized so which day you would you consider to give plasma in these patients Be- because of the limited resource we are prioritizing icu patients and so we're giving it earlier in the icu ideally within the first 7 days of icu admission um one of the things that's interesting about the clinical trial that i talked about the average time of symptoms was 30 days or longer so it is surprising because most people think you should give it much earlier during disease and so even at 30 days or longer there is a active viral replication and potential benefits from plasma but it, again that was a small study so the last question what are the contraindications and uh, what percentage of patients in your experience you've seen trolley yeah the the um, this was on the chat asking before it's you know with trolley we really worry about hla antibodies and some immune um immune reaction um pregnant women um in most um studies have are not able to donate convalescent plasma in our experience um we've given convalescent plasma to 30 different patients and we haven't seen any episodes of trolley um there's been two episodes of circulatory overload or volume overload and those have been treated with diuretics and the patients have done fine and so we haven't seen too many side effects but it's hard to know if we've really seen efficacy you know just a little uh, small question how early one can donate plasma because all countries have different criteria for donating plasma like in india after the person is symptom free 28 days after most of the studies and people are donating and the other thing is is rt pcr at the end of the treatment necessary and from there you consider or 28 days from symptom free that's a very important Yeah it's it's as you said it's variable across continents and across centers who collect convalescent plasma um our experience is we're waiting until PCR testing is negative symptoms are negative and then we're acquiring convalescent plasma we're checking antibody titers in patients who are donating convalescent plasma so there are many people who recover from covid-19 infection but may not have high enough antibody titers 
to um, qualify to donate convalescent plasma. And then um, there's the other steps that are required, but then they're asked to donate. Thank you, Pavan. So over to Ram. If you say more to Ram, I, I have uh, a, a doubt that I want to clear. And, you know, if you look at the plasma papers, and I've been looking at most plasma papers, and especially the Dutch study has actually changed uh, the whole outlook. If the ones who are really getting sick have strong antibody teeters as patients and be given plasma when they already have antibodies, what are we achieving? And in fact, we um, want to start measuring antibodies before we consider anyone for inclusion in the trial. Uh, for plasma and we are part of a multicentric trial. My question is conceptually again, uh, because unless the RTCs, uh, uh, you know, RCTs get published, we won't have this. But wouldn't plasma really help in the first few days? Because if you're going to develop antibodies and the ones who get sick, what is the point? And again, so much confusion. If you look at some of the initial uh, trials, the plasma has been collected from individuals without measuring tetras. It's been done very randomly by just looking at an arbitrary number of days after recovery. So honestly, it's, it's a little bit of a, a fuzzy situation with plasma. So Pavan, why not give it very early? Yeah, and, and I completely agree with what you're saying. I think... As you've said, there's a lack of data in this field, and really there's not a lot of published data explaining when the convalescent plasma was collected in what patients. I think early um, sounds reasonable. I think um, clinically, and doing that often is challenging because patients present, as we've shown in our studies and others have shown, usually a week or longer after symptoms. And so unless you're moving this to the outpatient setting, there's going to be times where you're giving administering convalescent plasma a week or two weeks after symptoms have started. Thanks, Pavan. Over to Ram for the next slot. Yep, thank you. And uh, the next uh, couple of questions are coming your way as high. Um, you mentioned very clearly that there is very little evidence for using Fabipravir, but if you decide to use, what is the timing? When would you use? Would you use it only in the outpatient setup or after? The, is there any role after the patient is admitted? So as of now, again, uh, there is zero data, but there's a lot of anecdotal data accumulating, especially in India, because there's very little restriction in who uses it. Uh, I have known patients who have been hospitalized who have been getting it, but honestly, we do not have information on what the outcome is. The guesswork would be that if it works for influenza, we would expect to use it similar to influenza, but coronavirus is not influenza, so we have to wait and watch. I know that there are several patients who have been getting it uh, in the outpatient setting, and it is a lot of pills to take. And uh, many have actually not tolerated what I've heard. Uh, you have to watch the uric acid level also. Uh, th there has been, uh, you know, out of desperation, people are doing it. And I am hoping that people who are doing it actually keep track of the information and maybe even publish it. Uh, there was somebody in the chat who said he has treated several patients with it. It would be worthwhile, really, if you can actually collect your information and go ahead and publish that information because it would help others. And similarly, the dose also is very varied from 1,200 to 1,600, 1,800, 3,200. What is the dose you would recommend? So I would go with the DACA trial, which just con concluded. Uh, this is different from what the Indian uh, regulatory dose is. The DACA trial used, I think, 3,200 and then 1,600. So, so it was a pretty high dose that they were using. Uh, in fact, they did like 200 milligram tablets, uh, like 1,600 on day one twice, and then day 2 to 10, they use 600 twice a day. Uh, the standard treatment was oxygen, uh, intravenous rehydration, electrolyte correction, analgesics, antibiotics, and anti-emetic drugs. So, uh, and there was only 25 patients who got the drug. So honestly, I think I would go with this trial because this is the closest I have to say blinded, not really blinded, but a placebo comparator. All the other comparators are drugs they are actually not using now. So I think to me, this was the most meaningful so far. Now, one question actually I have back at you is... Uh, so several questions coming up because you guys are infectious disease. Many are asking, should we put these patients on antibiotics? Do we need to use antibiotics? That's a you know, clinical question. Uh, what are your thoughts for all the ID specialists here? Uh, I, I'll say on behalf of Ram Gopalakshan also that I don't think there is any role for antibiotics. We don't use antibiotics if the patient is confirmed to have COVID. And if there is no reason to suspect anything else, we don't. We, of course, do a procalcitonin and then tend to repeat it after a few days. The only time when we consider is, as Ram Gopalakshan has said, if the person has received the tocilizumab or if the patient goes on a ventilator and continues to deteriorate, we rule out the venous thrombus, uh, thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism. In that situation, we consider antibiotics. Is there anything you want to add, uh, Gopal? No, I, I agree with that, uh, Ram. 
Uh, there's one question which is not related to what you spoke about, uh, Sai, but this has come up that if a person dies in India, a person not, dies two to three weeks after uh, having been admitted with COVID, uh, is the death still considered as related to COVID? Even though he recovers after COVID, would you still, what, what is the current status? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I think I would hazard a guess that on the death certificate, you would probably put that in because we are seeing some late presentation, perhaps under-recognized inflammation, under-recognized hypercoagulable state, and unlikely under-recognized infection, more likely, I think, an under-recognized hypercoagulable state. I think that would be. If you look at the autopsy studies that the NEJM published, there is a fair amount of micro-clotting happening in a fairly diffuse uh, manner. So whether that is what is causing this is unclear. Now, one of the other parts in terms of you know mortality statistics, uh, it would, I think, be behoove all of us to start documenting you know, what the cause of death is, because mm -hmm. not knowing the exact cause, we will not know. There is also the concept of the verbal autopsy that has been used in several countries where they make phone calls, even ask the family, what did your family die of? And that has been validated as a reasonable way of estimating the cause of death. Thank you. Over to you, Rajesh. Thank you. So my questions are for Dr. Pooja Shah related to remdesivir. You know, this is a very uh, odd question. You know, person has symptom of uh, COVID, RT-PCR negative, but CT is very classic. Can you give remdesivir? in this patient who is hypoxemic? So um, the, the thing over here in the US, we need to have a positive um, COVID swab in order to give remdesivir. Because our child, what we're under the expanded access, we have to give it because of um, that was part of the requirement set by the Gilead company, by the FDA. So unfortunately, without the positive test, we can't give remdesivir because we're being monitored by the, um, by the FDA here in the U.S. So if there is a person who is having a cytokine storm, and uh, can you would you like to give remdesivir and tocilizumab together, or is there any interaction, interaction among them? So what we've been doing here in New Jersey is we try to space out all our treatments because we don't know the co-interactions. So we try to give, we would give tocilizumab first, and then wait before we start remdesivir. Because we have actually seen good outcomes with our patients who got tolizumab when they're in cytokine storms. And so we feel that was working more. And remdesivir might take some time to work on patients. So that's why we would first give the tolizumab and then the remdesivir. How many days after the tolizumab? We space it between 12 to 24 hours. So almost within, within a day, you start remdesivir. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was this concern about the remdesivir and DEXA. Can you combine these? Can you talk a little more about this? You know, it's um, over here. We just started using more dexamethasone. We've always been using solumedrol in our um, patients here. It is all new right now. So it's hard to know what the real interaction is because the data is all outcoming. So I really can't say personal experience because we're, in, um, we're just starting to use more dexamethasone here. And so we won't, I can't say what it is, but I think we need to do more. More data needs to come out with the interactions to know. And anything with COVID, it's so hard to know, is it the drugs, is it the therapies, or is it the COVID disease itself? And that's what we've been learning through this whole process with this disease. A lot of like side effects we see, is it because of COVID or is it because of the drugs we use? And it's sometimes hard to know which one is causing what in some of these patients. You know, in addition to the liver toxicity, are there any side effects which you need to look for when you are giving ground them the disease? I've noticed kidney issues a lot of kidney issues. So that's why I always recommend to give, sometimes you can give like, especially um, the very sick patients, you can give like a little bit of a pre bolus of like 250 cc of fluid before and after the drug to help flush out the drug to protect the kidneys as much as you can. And I saw it more in our intubated patients kidney failure and our non-intubated patients, we saw more liver failure. Okay, thank you very much. So over to Ram for the next section. And before Ram starts the next session, I just uh, wanted to do uh, Mention to everyone that we are really blessed that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, will be addressing us for the next session. And it's on the 23rd. And it's uh, because the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, gets up at 3 in the morning. This has to be a morning session. It's going to be 9 a.m. IST on the 23rd. But everyone needs to pre-register. And so anyone interested can just send us a mail at GAPIO database. G-A-T-I-O, all small case, database, D-A-T-A-B-A-S-E at gmail.com. So GAPIO database at gmail.com. If you're interested, over to Ram. 
Okay, the last uh, section is uh, for Dr. Agam Vora. Um, what there is, there is so many available therapies now, including steroids and antivirals and uh, you know uh, anti um, heparin and stuff. So, where would you place Sepsivac in this uh, group? Is it uh, along with it? Is it before? Is it after? Mm, thank you very much for that question. And uh, you know, to tell you truth, we do not know answers for most of these questions. We in Mumbai are on fire. The cases are all our hospitals are full of COVID patients. In fact, in my ICU currently there are six patients admitted, uh, you know, all critical. Uh, and unluckily, these drugs are not easily available. Remdesivir, you know, you would have read in papers probably, you know, at double the triple the price, it is not available. Tocilizumab is not available. In that situation, you you know, it's a it's it's do or die kind of situation, and you're trying out all possible immunomodulators that you have experienced. So in that situation, I've started using, uh, you know, Sepsivac. Though it is a very initial experience, only handful of cases are put on this. So wherever I'm not able to put them on any immunomodulator, as as I understand or as I look at this disease, probably initial phase is viremia phase, and then comes the you know cytokine storm. So whenever probably there is more of inflammatory changes going on at that stage, I would like to introduce some immunomodulator. Uh, if I get my hands on this tocilizumab, yes, my first choice would be tocilizumab because uh, probably there is better understanding about tocilizumab than uh, sepsivac. But then if I look at the pathophysiology or the level at which sepsivac works or the proposed mechanisms, probably I, I am tempted to use this particular molecule in that situation. So where I have used it so far, Whenever those patients, I have always given them uh, antivirals, you know, whenever possible. So either these patients are on pavipiravir or these patients are on remdesivir. And if they go into this cytokine storm, probably at that stage, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Sepsivac. I have used it in the dose which, which is what is recommended, and that is 0.1 ml at three sites. So I would give it on two, probably four amps and one deltoid uh, uh, daily for three days. So that is 0.3 ml daily for, uh, for three days. That is a dose that I have used. I will tell you that uh, uh, my my person, I have a bias for all immunomodulators and my personal bias uh, tells me that yes, it works. Uh, I have not done any kind of uh, study, I have not done any kind of comparative analysis, but I think it is, it is working. The only side effect that I see is a big induration patients get, you know, and then, then there is probably in some patients there is ulceration and in fact I can show you, I also have got a small ulcer on my, you know, um, I took it myself and there is a small ulcer formation. So probably th these are the only uh, side effects. Otherwise, it is fairly safe. What is the cost? Cost is not much. I think it is costing from uh, uh, 2,500, uh, I think 7,000 rupees for three three doses uh, put together. For, for, for three days, I think it will be somewhere around 18, 19,000 rupees max. And and lastly, I'm a little confused. Would you recommend it as part of treatment or as part of prevention? No, no. The, the whole idea started as the uh, treatment, part of treatment, you know. But then, then uh, since the uh, DCJ gave permission for, uh, you know, the trial was designed for primary uh, prophylaxis as well. And, uh, you know, with my personal experience with this particular molecule for the last 15 years, I thought of uh, taking it. So then a lot of uh, chest physicians, across the country, if I can name uh, probably, you know, 35, 40 chest positions who I know of have taken it uh, themselves. So we are in the early phase to recommend it as primary profile axis, but I'm convinced about uh, secondary profile axis and cytokine storm utility for sure. Thank you very much. Over to you, Anupam. Thanks ever so much. This was really fascinating. I think the number of questions we covered, of course, we can carry on for another one hour, uh, getting into uh, all the, the minor issues. But I think the major issues have been covered. And of course, uh, one thing that is loud and clear uh, for everyone's benefit is that uh, we should look at evidence. We should not go with anecdotal, my personal experience here, what, what one might have heard. Because at the end of the day, we have seen so much change in uh, the treatment of uh, COVID-19 over the last few months. And I don't know how much more will change. Uh, so I guess we will continue to have more and more of these sessions. We will do another one on therapy next month. We're also going to do one on diagnosis because I think we, there's a lot to learn in terms of serology and antigen testing and, and what have you. Uh, I want to thank everyone. And I'm, we're really delighted that this time we had two very young clinicians, uh, and Kavan, uh, you know, second generation, uh, trained, born in the United States. And I just wanted to highlight that we are encouraging young people to become a part of the faculty here. 
And of course, everyone is peer reviewed before they are invited to speak. We look at their experience, we look at the research, uh, and we look at whether they've got hands on experience or not. Really happy to have Pooja and Pavan, of course, very senior, very distinguished clinicians on board as well. Thanks ever so much on behalf of the uh, Global Indian Physician Collaborative. We had 900 plus. Uh, delegates from across the world. We look forward to welcoming you on the 23rd for uh, a very special session with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, like I mentioned, if you want to be a part of that session, please send us a mail at database at gmail.com. Thank you very much and uh, uh, have a wonderful day and uh, in, in, in Europe and uh, the United States and, and Canada and for all of us in Asia and Australia, of course. Very good day. <laughs>